All right, welcome folks. This is what is on our dance card for this evening. We're going to be talking about, first of all, I'm going to do a presentation later on. We'll go into breakout rooms where uh, you folks will have an opportunity to chat with a couple of classmates, share your uh, share your inter, uh, your paper with them, and get some constructive feedback. We'll be talking about, well, first of all, why are we doing this data collection? Why is this useful to me as a teacher or a future teacher of kids with special needs? What's its real world, world use? We'll talk about how we operationalize a target behavior, that a behavior that causes us concern, either because there's too much of an inappropriate action or there's not enough of an appropriate action, how do we define it in observable and measurable terms? We'll get much more into that. And once we've defined the behavior, well, what is it that concerns us about the behavior? Is it how often it's happening? How long it's happening? Is it the force behind that action? Is it where it happens? Is it that it takes too long to happen or it's happening too soon? We'll look at the different dimensions of behavior. We need to identify which one is of concern so that we can choose the right recording procedure. Will we use frequency recording, duration recording, momentary time sampling, partial or whole interval recording? We need to know the dimension that follows the operational um, definition of the target behavior in order to choose the right recording procedure. Yeah, we'll have a Q&A there. And something else that we'll see in part two. So yes, indeed, why, why, why do we do this complicated, involved, um, does it have anything to do with teaching? Does it have anything to do with classroom and behavior management? And yes, indeed it does. Given the federal guidelines, what's been passed down by the US Office of Education, the Department of Special Education, we have guidelines that we must follow when it comes to um, assessing a behavior that concerns us and then doing something about it. So yes, if we have concerns about a behavior, we must conduct an RTI. Now, whether you decide to enter in what RTI stands for in the chat, or maybe you're just going to ponder it, does it come to mind? What is RTI? Oh yeah, I remember that from SPED 700.5, right? Response to intervention, a, co a, a committee, a group of professionals within our school would come into the classroom and do some other observations and make some recommendations to the teacher as to what he or she or they might do um, to help redirect this youngster and produce appropriate behavior in this youngster. I don't know if you're up on the research regarding a RTI. It's required of us, but guess what? The research for the last, uh, oh, I see 15 years says it ain't working. Response to intervention doesn't seem to have any effect um, on the behavior that we're addressing. But I guess until, you know, it's Newtonian law applied to special education, a force in motion continues in motion until I guess we find something else that uh, another alternative. But if it's ineffective in managing behavior, which is most often the case, we then conduct an FBA. If you're looking to show me that you're still involved in this session, you know, do enter in what FBA is or a little bit about it. Uh, otherwise, again, you can just ponder it. What is FBA? You might even be Googling it at this very moment. But it is, yes, indeed, 
functional behavior assessment. We must um, determine what is the function of the behavior. And I'm going to leave that hanging for just a second. And from this investigation, from this assessment to determine the function, we then, if this behavior is of concern, it, you don't need to be labeled emotionally disturbed, which is the federal label for kids who have behavioral and mental health concerns. Um, yeah. Uh, no matter which disability, which challenge, which disorder, it's hard to find terms nowadays as um, we find we find concerns with just about any label we come up with. Handicap, no longer popular, no longer used because it referred back to begging, having one's cap in hand. Disability is falling out of favor because dis means lack of, lack of ability. Is it differently abled? Is it challenged? The terminology is constantly changing in special education, thus the need to keep up with it. For example, mental retardation is no longer used. As you know from SPED 700.51, it's intellectual disability. But anyhow, from the uh, assessment, the functional behavior assessment, we devise a BIP. It's a part of the IEP, that special education document in the special file cabinet, in the closet, in the school office. And it contain this part of the IEP is the BIP, the Behavior Intervention Plan. The things that we are going to do, the interventions that we are going to implement to help this youngster make better behavior choices, to replace an inappropriate behavior pattern, at least inappropriate for the school. It may be very appropriate for other settings, but inappropriate for the school, changing it out to a more appropriate for the school behavior pattern. And yes, these new behaviors that we're trying to promote through the BIP, through the behavior intervention plan, they must meet the same function, the same purpose as the behavior that we're trying to eliminate, reduce, or replace. It's gotta meet that same need and do so at least to the same degree, otherwise, why would a student change his or her ways if the payoff isn't as, as good, isn't to the same level? And during that, or during the development of the FBA, which is fairly recent, I'm sorry, I don't uh, recall the date, but I'm thinking it's gotta be somewhere around 79 or 80 that, um, the FBA was required for behavior. And it was heavily influenced by advocates for one theoretical model, applied behavior analysis. And therefore, its ways of assessing and its ways of teaching new behaviors uh, tend to be quite prominent, sometimes to the exclusion of other explanations for why people miss or why people show the behaviors they do, how they developed, and how to go about changing them. All right. So applied behavior analysis is based on the laws of physical science. Think chemistry lab. Think, um, <laughs> think physics, think um, weather prediction. That, and the question that I'm guessing is um, rhetorical, we don't really, uh, we'll have different answers and different views on it, is can the laws of physical science, 
can the laws of physical apply, <laughs> excuse me, easy for me to say, uh, physical science apply to humans? Hmm. Something for you to ponder. But what's the function? If you would now enter in some synonyms, some other words, some other terms for function so that we fully understand what function means. It's not a term we typically use unless we're special educators involved in trying to determine why a kid is showing that particular behavior. Yes, the purpose, the reason for the behavior. Um, as I look through the um, the chat, I'm finally seeing you, Jennifer, and uh, seeing your message. Let's see what we can do here. Co-host abilities. So we're going to take just a second here while I attempt to figure out how to do this. It's honestly fine because now it, it's established on the interpreter, so it's good. So then you're okay, you're okay with the way I'm things good. are? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Jennifer. We're pleased to have you with us tonight. All right. There we go. Yep. The purpose, the reason, the drive, the motivation, what they're getting out of it. Well done. So according to applied behavior analysis and now functional behavior assessment because of the influence of the ABA model, what are the functions of any behavior? The ABA folks narrow it down. They say, you know, in general, any behavior you're talking about, because all behaviors have a purpose, according to ABA. There is a purpose to every behavior. Why don't I jump up now on the table in front of me, um, grab my buttocks and shout, whoopee? What would be the payoff? In fact, there's probably going to be some punishment from doing for doing that. And so, gosh, uh, there's no, I don't do it because there's no payoff for doing so. But what are the two general areas of payoff, benefit, uh, function of any behavior we can mention? I'm not seeing a quick response, but I assume when you folks have studied the ABA model and uh, take the quiz related to it, you'll be able to answer that with facility. I'm seeing a couple of contributions here and thank you. Um, yes, um, attention is a function. Uh, we're getting a dimension of behavior mixed in there with, with uh, latency. But yes, attention and escape, these are reasons, benefits to showing a behavior. How so? Well, there are the two general um, uh, functions of behavior. Why do people do what they do? And it doesn't have to be inappropriate behavior, just anything you do, the way you prepare to go shopping, the way you get ready for, for, for sleep at night, the, the, the way you decide to um, uh, um, instigate, instigate a conversation. Okay. It's either to obtain something desirable, something you'd like to have, and it might be attention, or it might be um a uh, an, an object but something you find desirable or on the other side of the fence the behavior is shown because you either avoid a situation you don't want to be in 
or if you are in that situation which you defi you find um, discomforting and you know and want to escape, showing a behavior um, to escape something that you do not want to be involved with. Um, and if if that desirable thing, let's go with the first general function, if that desirable thing is obtained, we say that behavior has been two words, let's see, the beginning letter of each word, P and R. Yes, indeed, Jillian, I recognize the, from the family name. Yes, positive reinforcement, and that's been verified by a couple of your classmates. If, you, if your behavior obtains something that you find desirable, it has been positively reinforced. You got something that you view in a positive way. So what happens to the behavior when it's positively reinforced? And what are some things that commonly serve as positive reinforcers? Now, we know that nothing is desired by everyone, okay? but what are some things that we commonly reinforce kids with or that were reinforced? Yes, indeed, when a behavior is positively reinforced, it strengthens it. It increases the chances of it happening again. Gosh, those positive things that we could, how about teacher praise? But you're going to study in one of the learning modules that of about 13 different types of praise that have been studied, only two, maybe three, actually serve that purpose of creating more of the behavior that we have just verbally recognized in a positive manner. Some types of praise have absolutely no effect. And there's a couple of them that actually reduce the chances of the praise behavior being shown again. One of the ones that we'll talk about is praising the kid's identity. You're so smart. That's likely to reduce the behavior that you have just praised. More on that when we get to that module. Oh, goodness, lots of good things here. Um, edible stuff, um, something that just feels good, sensory, that is a sensory uh, a pleasing, um, enjoying certain activities and materials. Mm -hmm. Now, if a behavior works to prevent or escape an undesirable situation, it has been two words, the first two letters, uh, first letter of each word, N, R. Oh. If what you, if the behavior you engage in helps you stay away from something you don't want to be involved in, or helps you escape something that you're, you, feel, you feel yourself captured in, yes, indeed, it's negatively reinforced. Now, this is a term that we are going to study more in depth in one of the modules because it seems odd to have negative and reinforcement in the same phrase. But anytime you see reinforcement, you know it's going to create more of the behavior that has just worked. If you escape a situation you view as being negative, hey, you've been reinforced. You have avoided punishment. Now, gosh, can we give some examples? All right, for those of you, I mean, uh, you know, many of you are at the age where you're dating right now. Have you ever been on a bad date? What did you do to escape that? Oh, um, um, my goodness, I've got to get up early tomorrow. Um, well, look what time it is uh, you know, and the various excuses that were used on me back in the day. But uh, yes, uh, you know, um, you're, you've been served some food that you are not enjoying. Gosh, what are some of the ways that you manage to avoid having to eat it? Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, my stomach hurts and 
forgot to milk the cows. Okay, that's, I've only heard that three or four times when I've lived out in Illinois. Yeah, negatively reinforced. What happens to the behavior? Anytime you see the word reinforcement, you think, ah, oh, this behavior is being strengthened and we'll probably see more of it. If we don't see more of a behavior we've positively or negatively reinforced, then chances are what we think is reinforcing is not reinforcing to the other person or not to the same degree as a behavior that brings more of what it is the person seeks. All right. Yes, uh, like any of the models, but ABA is a science. Uh, those of you who will be in my um, methods class for behavior disorders will read an article that is saying that, well, if it is science, it's 1940s and 50s science. But nevertheless, um, ABA, like all models, attempts to eliminate conditions that are causing inappropriate behavior to happen, getting rid of what the ABA folks, the uh, behaviorists refer to as uh, the stimuli, um, the antecedent for inappropriate behavior. And like any model trying to reduce maladaptive behaviors, behaviors that don't fit well into certain circumstances and settings, and some of the other things that are um, common to all theoretical models and frameworks. Mm -hmm. Yep, all behavior has a function. ABA focusing on, ah, see, ABA's folks say all behavior is learned. Your environment has acted upon you. If people and things in the environment responded in a positive manner, positive to you for showing a certain behavior, then yes, you'll show more of it. And if you have been punished for showing a certain behavior, you didn't get a positive response, you got a negative response, negative to you, then you're going to drop that behavior, that your environment determines the behavior profile that you have right now. Your behavior patterns have been built by the environment, according to the ABA folks. And because of their influence on the functional behavior assessment, they are going to clearly and explicitly define behavior. Well, they do, and you will. And there are certain laws of behavior that they say have been proven and verified in research but those of you in the methods course with me will find out that, gee, the research is showing that their interventions for children with autism don't work. In fact, might be counterproductive in opposition to what is typically promoted that you will read. Oh, by the way, you don't have to be in my methods course if you have an interest in reading this article, um, this manuscript, just uh, send a request. All right, applied behavior analysis. Applied to what? Applied to real life situations. This isn't done in the clinic, like some models where you treat somebody in a clinical setting, one-on-one -on -one or in a small group. ABA is actually implemented in real life situations. And of course, the focus on behavior, but it has to be observable and measurable. Yeah. Now, behaviorists wouldn't deny that people have emotions and thoughts and experiences that influence their behavior, but they would tell us you can't measure those very well. The only thing we can say for certain that we can measure is observable surface behavior, the laws of physical science. If you can't see it, if you can't witness it in some way, then you've got to throw it out. It's a confounding variable. Mm -hmm. 
behavior is lawful and predictable. And some folks would say, I don't know. There's a lot of behavior that happens that might not be predicted by the physical laws of science. Mm -hmm. Yep, that emotions can affect our behavior, but not the behaviors wouldn't deny that you have emotions, feelings, and such. It's just that, you know, we really shouldn't throw them into the mix when we're assessing behavior because they're so vague and nebulous and, and difficult to figure into the equation. So like any model, they want to achieve these goals. Okay, where's the analysis come in, that second A? Oh, well, we've collected some data, numerical information, and now let's make some sense of it. Let's analyze it. Let's, uh, let's, let's get in there and try to find uh, some meaning to it. For example, did the behavior increase in how long it happens or the number of times it happens or other dimension? As we keep track of behavior, as we intervene, we continue to keep track of the behavior in order to determine are our interventions working? If they aren't, then it's time to cross it out and come up with some new interventions for the behavior intervention plan because what we're doing ain't working. So, and if it is working, then we want to continue on. Oh, you'll remember from the learning module that you investigated for part one, that there are six dimensions of behavior, six ways in which behaviors can, can differ, six ways in which they can change. Let's add a couple into there right now. It doesn't matter if you're late entering it, you know, we'll still get, you know, this is a way of showing, hey, I'm there and I was just a little bit slower on the keyboard than, than some of the others. Yep, frequency, duration, latency, topography, locus, so there's six of them and we're coming up with, oh, there's topography. Um, oh, lotus, it sounds like a lovely flower, but do we know it's locus? Yeah. Latency. Okay, nicely done. Yeah, a little hint there, the FDMLLT, frequency, duration. Ah, there's one I wasn't seeing. It may have been in the chat. M for magnitude, the force behind a behavior, the difference between a tap and a punch, force. Then latency the time that elapses between a stimulus and the behavior, okay? between the do it and a kid doing it. That we, well, we'll get into this in a, in a bit more in just a second. Let me check the chat room again. All right, thank you for the contributions. How else could you remember this? How about Dr. Mack lectures for long times? How about that? We got the D, Dr. M, Mack, L lectures, F for long L times. Ah, mnemonic device, a heuristic for remembering those six. <laughs> and so we ask you to keep this in mind. What we're trying to do with any intervention is to create more appropriate behavior in hopes of it reducing or replacing the present errant actions. And the placement, the replacement process works best when, and I think we've already discussed this, 
Yes, indeed, it has the same function. We can't choose any behavior willy-nilly. We've conducted a functional behavior assessment, and when we're creating the BIP, we have to keep in mind, we need interventions that meet the same function, the same motivation for the kid, the same drive, the same reason. In an investigation of behavior intervention plans in one research study, they found that 70% of behavior intervention plans did not include interventions that meant the same function. It was sort of a, a cookie cutter approach to developing IEPs in the VIP. BIP. We've got our favorite things that we do and they forgot, no, the favorite things you do have to meet the same function to at least the same degree or else the student's not gonna change out his, her, or their ways. So then let's talk about the behavior. We've made it through ABA. Um, if there are any questions, concerns, or comments that need to be made regarding ABA, now would be a good time. Feel free to either speak up or enter it into the chat. Otherwise, in just about 30 seconds or so, we will enter into um, what's involved in the part one paper. Professor? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Yes, please. All right. Um, a student who who come into class uh, every morning and get to uh, sleep on the on the desk, can we call that a behavior? Absolutely. It is observable. You can say now. I would ask you, okay, if I'm if I'm coming in, sir, and I know your name, but I don't want to pronounce it on the uh, on on the video and identify so we'll say an anonymous. Um, yes, but I would say, well, would you define sleeping for me so I know it's different than resting or refusing to take part in your lesson? And you might define it as. Uh, arms folded on desk, head down in arms, um, no response to quiet inquiry, where you say, hey, are you with me? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, you, it is certainly a behavior, but you have to observe it, uh, you have to define it in observable, measurable terms that I can witness so that if you were keeping if both of us were looking at this behavior that particular day, we have the same data report. We have the same number of tally marks or the same duration that we would agree, which is why we uh, define behaviors in such specific ways. And somebody had their hand raised and please feel free to speak up. Hi. Hi. Um, this might be like, a weird question. I don't know. I'm just. I like to... weird questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, just like understanding like my school's, you know, lingo and what they say. But is there like a difference between saying like, oh, like that student is not, this isn't behavioral. It's more psych. Like I'm, is that, I don't know. I don't understand that. Like it's. Yeah, that's um frustrated generic terminology for, um, you know, when we're having trouble figuring out how to help this particular uh, student. But we will, uh, yeah, it's, there are certainly behaviors that are driven by one's mental health, the emotions, um, the, the, the feelings uh, that one is experiencing at that particular point. And there are other behaviors that can be manipulative. Let's say we've got a streetwise kid who says, hmm, I can exert some power or get some money out of this situation. And it's contrived and, it, and it's planned. So yeah, there are different driving forces, different functions behind behavior. And I, it sounds like your colleagues are saying, this is probably a mental health issue that is causing this student's behavior. Let's say, for example, that the student has experienced um, uh, some sort of abuse in, in the home or that this student is, um, um, does not have a home, is, is, uh, is, is homeless perhaps on the streets or in a shelter, and that the, 
just uh, the situation, the things that are on one's mind affects how one displays that. Am I dancing all around that question or have I centered oh, you, in on it? You answered it perfectly. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Now let's move on to part one. And yes, there are going to be six subheadings, which you bold to help me identify, you know, the different parts and, and know when you're switching. Um, the paper that you bring here tonight, or if not tonight, that you submit, will have a section that's titled, subtitled, Background. And you'll tell me about the student and the classroom that uh, you're observing in, or that perhaps you serve in. Tell me about the school. Where is it located? How many kids? What's, what are the demographics? Do you know anything about the student's family? Um, tell me about the neighborhood. Uh, you know, if you walked uh, a few blocks around the school, um, what's it look like? Uh, who's there? Um, yeah. And then there'll be a section on the individual for whom you are engaging in this investigation. Uh, for most of you, it is a student in a classroom, but for some of you who don't have access to classrooms, then it's another child in your life or to whom you have some, some access. Or for some of you, it's going to have to be an adult, a roommate, or, a, or a, um, a partner. But we hope that you'll be able to find a student as a uh, as the COVID restrictions and having guests uh, tend to lighten up. And then, uh, gee, do you, can you identify any influences on the behavior? And there's a caution statement that is in the description of part one, where we say, please don't say that the religion or the socioeconomic class or the kid's ethnic cultural group is definitely the reason the kid shows the behavior, but say it could be, or it's a possibility, or chances are we never, we can't talk in definites without really knowing um, in depth. Uh, so it might be that uh, this student is, um, uh, the family just immigrated a few years ago, and while superficially this youngster has adopted the popular culture and way of dress, we notice that there are some actions that tend to be very much the, the, the first culture. Uh, religion can have an effect on it. Um, we do find some differences given the, um, the, the the economic status of uh, of, of groups, um, um, you'll have to, again, I don't want to go too much into this, we say possible, All right? Um, does the gender or the gender identity play a part in this? Um, do you think it's got something to do with uh, the TikTok uh, videos that the kid is watching or the violent video games that are being played? Is the behavior age appropriate? Things along that line. Take your best guess, but again, qualify it as I don't know for certain, but this could be the case. We have readings um, uh, re regarding the influences of those different groups. And you can certainly, you, you've got a knowledge base and you can always uh, go to the internet and find out some other, but do find some reliable sites. Um, as opposed to self-proclaimed experts that are trying to get more um, more likes so that they can sell advertising. Oh, and then the big part here that we've been talking about, select one behavior. This, this student has three or four that are of major concern, but select one. For the purposes of this assignment, just one. I see someone's raised their hand. Please feel free. Hi. Um, Hi. So my question is about these subheadings. They're a little bit different from the ones that you have in the directions document. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, I didn't see influences on behavior. Is this another section that I should add? Or is it something that I should add 
within I, another. Well, it's something that I should add if it's not in there. I know I've seen it somewhere on Blackboard. And uh, so, yes, please uh, do include that um, influences on behavior. Okay. To make a, and thank you. And I'll try to get in there tonight and make sure that it is uh, 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 quite obvious. And yes, I see another hand raised. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Hi, um, I had a question as well about um, the target behavior. Um, I mentioned a couple because I'm in the background section explaining the focus learner. So mm -hmm. I mentioned he's has a he displays a lot of behaviors in the classroom. <laughs> So I mentioned some of the his other behaviors, maybe like to paint a picture of the type of student that I'm talking about. But I then I I mentioned which behavior I'm going to be focusing on. So you have nailed it. You, that's okay. exactly what we're looking for. Tell us all about the student, but in the target behavior section, only one. Right. Gotcha. All right. And let's see. Yep. Define the action. And the action can be a behavior that you would like to see more of. And then in part two, you're going to talk about, well, how would we promote more of this behavior we'd like to see? We'd like to see more hand raising. We'd like to see more in seat. Or it could be a challenging behavior. You can look at the other side of the coin that, you know, uh, we want to reduce out of seat behavior. So you choose whether it's an appropriate behavior for the school that you want to create more of in part two, when you talk about strategies you, you might use, or it can be a behavior that is maladaptive for the school setting. And in part two, you'll talk about how you would reduce it or replace it. Yep, the two terms that are really important, observable and measurable. You have to be able to witness it. You can't do any mind reading. You can't say things like, does it on purpose? Does it because it's, um, of mental health issues? According to the FBA, the investigation, it has to be observable. And we have to be able to measure it. We have to be able to say how long it lasts or how many times it happens or measure the force and the magnitude. So you define the behavior in one sentence and stop. Some people like to give examples, elaborate on exactly what they mean. Nope. One sentence, perhaps a second, if it's something like will only be observed during the, um, the welcoming period in the morning. You'll then identify, well, okay, so this behavior is of concern to educators, or it's a concern in the home of this child, or it's a concern in my home with my spouse, but which, which aspect of the behavior is of concern? That it's happening too often or not enough? That it's lasting too long or not long enough? That it happens too soon? Like when we say, I want you to think about this, children, students, scholars. I would like you to think about three ways that la, 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 and then raise your hand. But right away, the kid shouts out an answer. And we say, not only is the topography for answering wrong, shouting it out instead of raising a hand and being recognized, but the the latency is being given too soon. The magnitude, you know, that's the, the power, the difference between a whisper and a yell is the magnitude. So what be dimension is of concern? And then tell me in that part one, well, based upon the dimension, which of the recording procedures are you planning on using, in fact, for collecting data and reporting on it in part two? All right. 
when it's still going to be a, a while yet, but when we do get into the breakout rooms and you'll be with, say, let's say two other people, does the draft, your draft and the draft paper, the, uh, the, the working draft of your paper, um, other people's paper, does it contain those has subheadings? If not, give them a heads up so that they know to include it. Make sure that we're speaking in professional language instead of our everyday informal vernacular. Yeah, we got some des descriptions versus definitions. When, when somebody says, this kid is out of control, or we say, um, let's say the school-based support team is dropping in during the um, response to intervention uh, phase of assessment. And so, so um, tell me a bit about that, uh, the student. Oh, this kid is disruptive. This kid distracts others. This kid acts out. This kid needs to learn some discipline and some of the other ones there. And we say, okay, uh, you've got me in the ballpark, but I need it narrowed down to the seat in the ballpark. I need, well, how does this particular kid act out? Because there's a lot of ways of acting out. How does this kid indicate that, um, of, how is this kid disrespectful? There are many ways to be disrespectful. We need to define how this particular kid shows disrespect. Right, and that definition helps assure that we're all talking about the same thing. Yep, we all need to be on the same page of music, the same line of music, the same note of music, and perhaps the tone within that. So it's called operationalizing. We talked about this a little bit earlier, that we, we operate, operationalize a behavior, we define it in observable and measurable terms. Again, we focus on the behavior we try to remove our judgment of the behavior. Well, I guess we're making a judgment if we're saying let's assess it, but at least avoiding our judgment of the student. And we do so by what's called symptom separation. Hate that behavior. That behavior has to go. And I'm going to help this kid to replace that behavior with something that'll be more beneficial to him, her, or them in their lives. So yeah, I hate the behavior, but continue to view kids positively, kids who need our assistance, and we work on the behavior. Realizing that behavior is a form of communication. This behavior is telling us something. Collecting data will help us. And then the other things that we bring to the IEP meetings, the grades, the anecdotal reports that help us to figure out what is going on with this particular kid. What is this behavior telling us? Hmm. Yep, the three things we have to be sure are present in our target behavior, the one we define, the one that you could send off to me and say, what do you think of this, uh, this definition? And I'll give you some general feedback that if it's not already spot on, you'll be able to, uh, to work it so that it becomes observable, measurable, stated in a specific formal language. Remember to avoid words like not, never, and doesn't. We're talking about what the behavior is, not what it isn't. It's hard to measure something that isn't happening. What is happening? Or if we need to say that this youngster is not yet showing a behavior or not showing it enough, then let's use action verbs like student fails to um, abide by directions within, within 10 seconds of that direction being uttered. Okay? So we can say that there's a void there, 
but use an action verb, fails. Yep, check it out. We're interested in why the behavior is happening, but in the target behavior, in the definition, we don't mention why. Does it to, uh, does it for attention? Uh, does it to escape difficult work? No, we define the behavior that's happening. We don't get into the why. That comes after we have the data and when we've got more information. Then we try to figure out the function. But initially, just the behavior that we're keeping an eyeball on. Yep, what, he, what the student does versus does not. Yep, we get any, uh, we remove anything regarding mental health or engages in this um, behavior when fearful of the actions of others. Um, no, we don't look inside the head. An FBA is just looking at what is observable and measurable. only what we can witness. And as we said, define the behavior in one sentence and stop. And so when we do get into our small groups in a little bit, we look at each other's definitions. We share each other's definitions and we say, oh, does it have everything that's been mentioned? It could be seen or witnessed in some way, felt, heard, okay, sensed in some way. And um, yeah, is it defined in a precise uh, professional uh, phrasing? And as somebody was saying earlier that our students tend to show many behaviors that are of concern, but we're just for the purposes of this assignment, focusing in targeting one of them. So we look at whether that definition actually addresses just one behavior when we get together in our groups. And do not use not, oh, there's those negative things again. We wanna talk about what the behavior is. So there's an example. Student is engaged in a behavior other than the one directed by the teacher. So instead of saying we're off task, this is off task now, instead of saying not paying attention in class, oh, there's that word not. There's the absence of a behavior. What is happening at the moment? And that will be like too, you know, the student doesn't listen to me. Oh, fails to comply. That is observable. It's an action verb. And how would we modify these? Select any one of these and enter into the chat room an observable and measurable definition. It's got to be witnessed. It, your definition will be what is happening. Select one, take your time, enter it into the chat box. Okay, throws objects, and what's the definition of throwing an object? How will I know an object has been thrown? Ah, the child releases an object, they'll, they're coming fast and furious and uh, um, losing them as they move up. Releases an object into the air out of hand. But is there a difference between 
throwing? Is there a difference in topography and magnitude between throwing and dropping? that kind of release of an object into the air out of hand. And so if I were coming in to see this kid who throws objects, I'd say, okay, let's work on a definition. Oh, we're almost there. How about propels the object two or more feet from the body? That way, I know it hasn't been dropped. It's been propelled. <laughs> What was the question? The question was, please uh, define one of the statements that you see on our um, on our screen right now. These are not observable and measurable. They need to be defined, not described. Huh. Oh, what if it's less than two feet? Um, then that would be considered a drop. Okay. We're assuming this the, the youngster propels it at a distance versus hmm, there's another type of throw down at the ground. So maybe we need to get into magnitude. And that's going to be hard to measure. <laughs> but again, some definitions aren't perfect, but we try to come as close to perfection as possible. Non-compliant, when told to use the pencil for only tracking. And writing uses it to scratch the hand with the point of the pencil. Yes, I remember reading this in uh, a, a pre submission submission. And let's see. So we know the youngster has been informed that the pencil is only to be used for certain purposes, tracking and writing. And instead, the student uses it to scratch the hand with the point of the pencil. So yeah, not the eraser, that wouldn't count. And not the arm, that wouldn't count. But we're saying we know this kid. This is the kid's idiosyncratic behavior. Point of pencil, back of hand. And that's what we will be looking at. And we know that the youngster has been told to use it only for it. But yeah, told when, told at the beginning of the year, told the beginning of the day, we might even want to tighten that up a little bit. Doesn't try in math. Ah, completes less than three problems on a given worksheet during a 30 minute time period. And I would say, yes, that is observable and measurable. Are there three completed problems? Now, if we need to focus on accuracy, are the answers correct? We can add that in. But right now, it looks like we just want to see this kid putting forth some effort. Okay, refusing to do classwork. And gosh, I think that's there. But how does the youngster refuse? Does that matter? Um, is it head down? Is it saying, you can take this and put it where the sun don't shine? How does this kid refuse to do classwork? Is that important? Or do we just say, student fails to engage in assigned classwork? All right, so thank you for putting your brains into, uh, into uh, the, the I don't know, I need a word and it's not coming. So let's go on. Uh, here are some possibilities, okay? I might be thinking of a different student than you're thinking of. And so if we're thinking of different students, the definitions might be different, but I believe the RC, these are precise, observable, measurable stated in professional terminology. If not, please let me know and we will, uh, we will continue to work on it, refine it. Let's see, that was the first uh, three that we've got replacements. And then uh, the following three are some ones that have problems. Why do the last three have problems? Well, how do we know the kid is purposefully doing that and is seeking power. I mean, we think that's the reason, but when we're assessing the behavior, we just define it. We don't get into the whys just yet. Okay. 
doesn't try in math. Well, how do we know that? Ceases engagement before its completion. And boy, this kid does sloppy work. Well, what kind of sloppy and what particular assignments? And yes, there are two sides to the behavioral pancake. Uh, we've been focusing primarily on inappropriate actions, but do be aware that we can also define an appropriate one that we'd like to see more of. That when we define an inappropriate behavior and collect data on, in quotes there, a negative behavior, well, that's good for um, or what we'll do in part two, where you're going to identify which type of differential reinforcement procedure would you use with this student? There are many different types of differential uh, reinforcement, a $20 term for a $1 idea that we reinforce certain th things, but not others. We're differential in our reinforcement. And for behaviors that we've been recording that are inappropriate, we might choose, and you'll learn more about these when you get into the module on powerful practices for part two of the CAB MR, but DRO, differential reinforcement of other behaviors. I'll reinforce you for doing anything other than that behavior or differential reinforcement of lower rates of behavior. Brian, I noticed that you curse an average of 17 times during our class period. If you curse seven or 16 times or less, you will receive a reward, reinforcement. You're kidding me. I get to curse 16 times and you're gonna reinforce that? Yes, because 16 is better than 17. Now, th that may be something you can't do in your gen ed inclusive classroom. In my self-contained classroom for kids with conduct disorders, streetwise aggressive, that sort of thing, you know, <laughs> you were going to hear cursing. We were just trying to reduce it. Uh, Yes, and if you're collecting data on an appropriate behavior that we'd like to see more of, then we would use differential reinforcement of higher rates of behavior. I see that you contribute an average of one time per day in our classroom. Do it two times a day and you'll get a reward, reinforcement. And would no matter which one you do, there's a couple of procedures that you can use. And we come up with an interfering behavior that can't be done at the same time as the one that irks us. And we promote this one because we know if we promote this behavior, the kid can't show the other behavior. You can't be out of your seat if you're in your seat. You can't be using inappropriate language if you use an appropriate language. We come up with an interfering, or we could come up with an alternative behavior, one that meets the same function. So when you get together in your groups at some point, does the definition focus on the behavior that the kid displays? Does it describe the actions, what we witness? Ah, oh, which recording procedure to use? Study these. Frequency being used for behaviors that are, gosh, behaviors that are what? If you'd like to enter that into the chat or contribute orally, what are, um, when do we use frequency recording or what's known as event? We count the number of events. What is it about the behavior that makes us say, ah, frequency would be good for measuring that behavior. All right, didn't see it come in quickly there. So gosh, we make a tally mark for each quick occurrence. Frequency recording is used for behaviors that are short-lived or short-lived, ones that don't last too long. 
And instead of putting the stopwatch on them, we say, no, I'll make a tally mark each time I see that behavior happen. And there's an example of it. On this particular date, in this particular setting, research, or, um, uh, recess or music, I was watching for 15 minutes each time. What, what behavior hitting? It's been defined somewhere else. Let's see, uh, see it up, up high ab above the grid. Hit self with closed fist of right hand on right side of head. I'm thinking that this youngster has some sort of um, self-destructive behavior might possibly um, be somewhere on the autistic spectrum, although not necessarily other conditions, uh, we, we can find this behavior. And you know, counting the number of times, we don't know whether they're actually um, intervening at this point or whether this is baseline recording. Before we intervene, let's find out how many times it happens. And oh, um, Order. Yes, this is before the intervention plan is in place. Not quite sure why we have that blue painter's uh, masking tape down there across one of the uh, one of the areas, but uh, yeah. you know it's real life impinging upon what's recommended in the literature. Another, uh, I know, but when would we decide? When would we decide to use duration recording? Well, when the behavior tends to last a long time. And we say, well, what's a long time? I don't know, it, it's a judgment call. I had a friend who was um, very much um, an ABAer and uh, connect, conducted a lot of, um, of um, research investigations. He says the behavior lasts more than 10 seconds. I'm doing duration counting. Well, how'd you determine that? I don't know, it's a judgment call. And then we, look at all the incidences and how they how how long each one lasted we figure out well on the average how long does it last and i see another hand raised please feel free to chime in if our behavior analysis is about like a student that constantly calls out or like their impulsiveness can we do both frequency and duration um, typically call outs are rather short in length but you're saying when this kid speaks out, it continues on for let's say eight to 10 seconds or longer? Yeah, sometimes it's like, a, it's a word. And then sometimes it's like, they wanna either randomly tell me something and it's a, lo a long sentence or some maybe like a short story or something like that. So how would you want me to record that? I'm thinking that we could do duration recording, even if it's just a word that we don't even have to put the stopwatch on it. We just say, okay, that's a one second one or a two second one. Oh, but we mark the time for each one, or you may be counting in your head, 1,000, or excuse me, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, trying to estimate the seconds and uh, doing that in your head, but putting down the time for each one, we would then know how many outbursts there were, and we could figure out the average length of time also. Or it may be that we'll decide to go with uh, one of the other ones that's further down. Uh, you know, we could do, well, this is a duration recording that the first time it happened, uh, what was the start time, what was the end time, or we could just leave that out. And, you know, if we don't have, you know, we're busy with other things. We're trying to do duration recording while teaching. That's like, uh, you know, like, to, you know, keeping many balls in the air juggling. It's hard to do. Um, I believe uh, some of the uh, videos talked about ways to keep track of behavior while you're also teaching at the same time. But you could just mark down the duration first time, second time, third time. Let's see, the other ones there. Momentary time sampling. 
I'm not sure this would be appropriate for the behavior we just mentioned, but with momentary time sampling, we have signals alert us every so often. And there are apps for this that you can get on your phone and then connect it with an earbud or however you, um, yeah. And uh, you would hear this tone sound. You can set it to be an average of once every 10 seconds or an average of once every three minutes but you want to vary it that, you know, you're going to randomize it. Sometimes it's a minute and seven seconds. Other times it's four minutes and two seconds. The app will, um, will randomize it. And every time you hear a tone, you notice, is the behavior happening right now? Yes or no? And we make a yes mark or a no mark. And then we'll be able to look later on at what percentage of times when I looked over was it happening? Which ones we use? Well, we've got the materials inside the module, learning module for part one. And gosh, there they get, this person is observing a behavior every 10 seconds. In the first minute, you see, oh, there's six 10 second intervals. So this person is probably in the back of the room is not teaching right now because this is going to require a lot of watching this student. And first 10 second tone, the behavior, the target behavior was not happening. Same with the second and third, but in the fourth and fifth 10 second segments, the behavior did happen um, at some point. So a hand raised. Yes. Um, how long do you recommend that we observe the um, the student, like over a course of a week or? Uh, in real life, we would be constantly observing. I mean, just uh, or during a particular periods or maybe just when we're presenting the lesson before the students would then work in groups and then individually, we decide when we're going to observe, but it would be ongoing as we collect baseline data. What, what are we starting with in the way of behavior and also keeping track of, well, once we're inter, uh, intervening, lost track of my, <laughs> once we're intervening, we continue to collect data. But for the purposes of this assignment, I would say perhaps an hour and a half to two hours total of observation. This is just to give us practice in what you're going to be doing in real life. And so for practice, just getting to know the procedures, becoming familiar with it, you know, an hour and a half, two hours, you know, you do more than that. Certainly, um, I take notice and mm -hmm. I, I give credit, but not necessary. Just I want to get you folks to give it a try and become familiar with it. So another hand. Oh, just I'm sorry, one more. Sorry, I just had one more quick question while I have you. Are we going to include when we observe the student, like we observe the student after lunch, before lunch, because that may have maybe an effect on their behavior? So Most like definitely, <laughs> yes. We, we need to know where and when is this taking place? Is it during a particular um, class period, like uh, the language arts? or the, um, the morning meeting when the kids do the calendar and uh, learn some vocabulary and things along that line. We want to know when you're observing. That might be important. You might be observing in multiple situations that I'm going to observe um, in the morning and then I'll observe again in the afternoon because we think there might be some medication effects uh, and medication wearing off. Okay. Thank you. Uh, got a couple of hands raised. Feel free to someone to speak up. And if we mine, overlap, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, mine was sort of, I think it's sort of similar to that. Like I know a total of like 1.5 to two hours total, but say like you're looking at a class period and you're doing like a partial interval. So you're doing like five, if say there's 35 minutes in a class period, right. And you're doing five minute intervals, like to do seven, five minute intervals, like that would just be every that would be full so like would you do five five minute intervals because that's like 25 minutes or is that also like judgment like do three someday you know what i mean 
Yes, you could vary at different days. Uh, you know, it might be that you just, there are things going on that particular day when you're not able to observe uh, the usual times. In your data analysis, you would address that, that on the, uh, the fifth of the month, I was uh, able to, unable to, because we had uh, to go to an assembly. And, but I'm not sure I fully understood if you were observing for every five minutes you're looking up, momentary time sampling to see if the behavior is happening, yes or no, certainly you get credit for the whole five minutes, not just the one second you looked up. But well, I don't believe that's what you were saying, was it? No. So like I thought from my understanding is like 35 minutes. So let's say from like from 8.30 to 8.35, I'd be watching, I'd be observing, and I'm going to say yes or no. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to take a break at 8.35. And then maybe I'd start again at 8. Like, when would the next five minutes take place? Like, at 8.40? Like, give them a five. You know what I mean? Uh, it might be that you're observing from 8 to 8.30. And then again, from 10 o'clock to 10.20. And then from, you know, uh, 2.10 to 2.20. Oh, so it is all, like, if I'm if it, in a 35-minute class period, it should, it should be every of the five minutes. I know that's like a, like, from... 30 to 35, 35 to 40, like at each, every five minute segment. You can do it every five minutes, uh, depending on the behavior and okay. what, what the ty- um, the amount of data that would be helpful yeah. for a student who is hitting him or herself, uh, self on the head. Yeah, I may be observing every minute is the behavior happening, yes or no. Um, for something like, um, I don't know, calls out answers, you know, within the last Mm -hmm. five minutes or within the last 10 minutes, did it happen? Yes or no? Uh, There's, uh, feel free to bounce it off me that, you know, we can. uh, So we don't have to specify that in our report, like in our report, as long as we have like the five minute and we don't have to specify that. Yeah, it it would be great if you identify the time of day and the subject that is being taught. Of course, when we're recording it. And if I'm not addressing your question, feel free to stay after class tonight, or we can arrange a time to speak, and uh, just in particular, you and me about the assignment. Thank you. All right. Another hand or no? Yeah. Hi. Sorry. Um, I have a quick question. I have my defined behavior as needing adult support to get started on a task. And so, uh, you know, I think the real issue is latency. But then it, if I don't intervene, then the student will not complete any work. And so then it makes me think that I need to be recording frequency. Oh. Um, so I was wondering if you had any advice. I'm thinking we've got two different behaviors here. Does the student engage in the work when it's with... I think you and I need to talk personally about this because it in when do you decide to give guidance right away or after the student has failed to engage with the work? Um, after failure, but we can, I'll definitely connect with you. Through okay. I don't want to, you know, uh, just shoo this away, but, uh, but I, I would like to address it specifically with you just so that we can end class a little bit more quickly tonight. So do check in with me, please. Will do. Thank you. All right. All right. Momentary time sampling. There are signals indicating when you should look up and you make either a yes, it is happening mark or a no, it isn't happening mark and figure out the percentage. Other ways of of recording behavior, depending on the characteristics, and it is in one of the videos that is in the learning module for part one, it talks about, it has a flow chart and then talks about, well, how do I decide if I wanna do partial interval or full interval or momentary time sampling? And it will direct you to that. With partial interval, we are, 
during a period of time, could be one minute, could be five minutes, could be the period, could be the day, but in what interval makes sense for this behavior? Did the behavior happen at any time during that, let, let's say a five minute period? You know, it happens at the two minute mark. Okay, then I am gonna fill in that time block or I'm gonna make a mark to indicate that that behavior was shown at some point during the time period. That is used for shorter lived behaviors. Now for some longer lived behaviors, let's say sleeping on, on the desk or being off task, uh, then we might do full interval. During that five minutes, was the student engaged in the defined behavior for the entire time? So if you've got a five minute interval and at the start of that interval, the kid is engaged in the behavior, but then at the four minute and 45 second mark stops the behavior. We don't get to block in that, that, uh, that, uh, that box because it didn't happen for the full time. Well, let's say we got five minute intervals and this kid engages in the behavior for 17 minutes. Oh, well, let's see, that would be three of the boxes will fill in, but then he didn't make it fully uh, through that other, uh, that next box. Again, it's in a video and I'm willing to meet with you personally, but here would be an example of interval or an interval recording chart in which we say, okay, we've got interval one, two, three, we got 10 intervals there. You'll have to tell me whether they're five minute intervals or one hour intervals or for your class period, 47 minute intervals. But did the behavior happen at all? If you're using partial interval recording, did it happen at all in interval one? Did it happen at any time in interval two? And you make a yes mark or a no mark a zero or an X in this case, we see on this chart. If you're using full interval recording, did the behavior happen for the entire interval? Yes or no. And so when you get together with a couple of other folks, does it appear in each peer person's paper does it appear that the recording procedure is the best one for collecting data given the dimension of concern? So let's get together for a few minutes.